Hello, everyone, and welcome back to The Bridgehead. My name is Jonathan Van Maren, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. Now, today we have a, a very interesting show for you, as, as most of my listeners will know. Although I focus on a, on a lot of really, really difficult cultural issues, uh, I sometimes like to take a break and talk about the positive side of culture, literature and art and such things. And over the Christmas break, I actually did a, a four-part series on children's literature, because it's just good to remind people that, you know, in spite of everything that's that's happening in our world today, and in spite of the many different struggles uh, that we face, in spite of the many issues that demand our attention, uh, it's also good to, to just stop and, and to look at all the beauty that's around us and, and to look at the different uh, ways that we can engage our world through art. And one of the things that I've always been obsessed with, of course, is, is reading. I collected books from a very, very young age. And I usually read history and historical fiction, and I was actually quite surprised when somebody recommended uh, James Harriet to me. Now, the reason this surprised me is because uh, James Harriet was a veterinarian, and he had written a series of memoirs. Now, I didn't really think the memoirs of a veterinarian sounded particularly interesting, so I was very suspicious of these books. And it took me a little while to get around to them. They had been sitting on my dad's shelf for quite some time. Finally, I decided to read them, and I was instantly hooked. James Harriet, or uh, what is it? that's his actually his pen name. His real name is, is Alf White, but I think everyone will always know him as James Harriet. Is an absolutely wonderful writer. He he brings to the table a lot of the best attributes of the of the British writers. The the dialogue is is absolutely superb. His his timing in his writing is fantastic. And he just he humanizes people so well. He writes about his experiences in in Yorkshire uh, and he talks talks about the experiences he had with the farmers and the Dales and the interactions he had with people. He also writes about his time as a serviceman uh, during the Second World War. And overall, his, his books capture very vividly uh, a time that is now past. So I think that in addition to the power of the writing now, a lot of people read these books with no small level of nostalgia. And I've always wanted to have the opportunity to talk to one of his children about his books, because, of course, uh, when you read books that are autobiographical, but at the same time you know that some details have been changed, you're always curious uh, what those details are and, and how things really went, and were the characters in the books uh, precisely as James Harriet described them, or were they not? And James Harriet and his wife had two children, and both of these children actually became veterinarians as well. And uh, his son, James White, actually worked at the same veterinarian practice as his father, worked with his father for many, many years, and also uh, knew the same people his father did. So there was no better person to talk to about the life and the work of James Harriet than his son, and I was so thrilled uh, when I uh, just I emailed the James Harriet Museum asking if they could put me in touch uh, with one of his children to do an interview about his work, and uh, I, I got an email about a week later from James White himself, James Harriet's son, and I was I was quite thrilled to be able to have that conversation with him. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. What made you decide to write a book about your father? I was talked into it by my father's agents. <laughs> okay. It wasn't my idea at all. I can claim no credit for that. And then I thought to myself, well, I can't write a book because I, I, the last thing I wrote, time I wrote anything was many years ago at school. Right. Um, and so, uh, but then eventually I thought, well, this isn't a bad idea. And other people were, going to, were writing books about biography about James Herriot. And I realized they could be wide of the mark. And right. I thought, well, I know all about the man. I was close to him. I worked with him. Yeah, I have all the facts at my fingertips. And I did some research. And that was it, basically. I, I immersed myself in it for two years and did the thing. And this book was, so you wrote it, one, of course, because you knew him so well. But were you trying to correct any misconceptions from, say, Graham Lord's book? Yes. I didn't realize you, you've read Graham Lord's book. Well... Yeah, there was a lot of ifs and maybes and buts in Graham Lord's book, of course, because the people closest to my father wouldn't cooperate with him because they knew that I was doing mine. Right. 
and there were misconceptions with Graham Lord's book, but I wasn't out to attack his book. I decided uh, that that was not a good thing to do. Um, in fact, my editor helped me there. She said to me, look, don't attack Graham Lord's book. Put your own views, and your readers, they're not daft. They'll come to their own conclusions mm-hmm. of which is the right version. And I think that was good advice. But wouldn't it, isn't, it, isn't it somewhat frustrating to see someone who didn't know your father write a book and, and sort of theorize about your father? Yes, it was at the time. It was a bit hurtful. Um, the things that were a bit hurtful was he was, although he kept saying that my father was one of the nicest men he'd ever met, he said he, he accused him of being a, a writer of fiction and making up a lot of stories, which wasn't true. And he, he was very unkind to my mother. Um, and also to Siegfried, Donald Sinclair, my father's partner. Right. The character of Siegfried was assassinated, really, in Graham Law's book. Of course, he got this information from other, other people, possibly that didn't like Siegfried or didn't like my mother. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, th- yeah, there was a lot to put right, but I wasn't going to attack him. I was just going to put my version, mm-hmm. and the, the readers could see exactly which was the, the, the correct one. So what are some of the main misconceptions that people have, maybe from Graham Lord's book, maybe just in general, about James Harriet? When you, when you talked about the real James Harriet, what sort of misconceptions were you hoping people would avoid by reading your book? Yeah, one of the misconceptions was that, uh, for instance, Siegfried was a tyrant and my father was a wimp. Right. Um, because my father worked harder than Siegfried did, than, uh, than Donald Sinclair did. Um, that is absolutely true. He did. He did work a lot harder than Donald. But, you know, I've always thought there's two sides to every story. Mm -hmm. And if you look closely at the agreement between the two men, yeah, my father worked harder. He did. And he supported Donald in many ways. But he also earned more than Donald. Um, He said said to Donald, he said, look, I'm doing all the work. Everything that I do goes into my pocket and everything you do goes into yours. That's fair enough, isn't it? Mm Mm-hmm. And so there's another side to all these stories, which I managed, hopefully, to put into my book and correct some misconceptions. The other big thing was that my father being a writer of fiction, and a lot of his stories were what they described as apocryphal stories and jokes and things. But they were, they were all based on fact. Um, so I, I had to put that one right as well. Mm-hmm. It's interesting that when you bring, you bring up Donald Sinclair, because Siegfried Farnan is one of the most captivating characters throughout the books. He and, is, and he I, is. I think it's because he's rendered so well, you know, his, his uh, long sanctimonious pauses when he's about to, you know, critique James Harriet for something. And, and uh, there's a lot of stories about how um, Donald Sinclair purportedly didn't like the books very much, whereas his brother, uh, Brian, or, or Tristan, loved the books. How much truth yes, is there to that? Oh, well, it's absolutely true. It's de- absolutely true. Brian Sinclair was probably one of my father's two, two best friends of all time. My father and Brian were very close. Right. My dad was also very close to, to Siegfried as well. Um, Donald Sinclair Siegfried was the most unpredictable, one of the most difficult, but also one of the most likable and honest men I've ever known. Right. But he, he could be terribly awkward and difficult. But when you think of the enigma of the man, uh, uh, he, he, he said to my father, this book is a test of our friendship. <laughs> but with the next breath, you read that he's, when the All Creatures Great and Small was being filmed, Donald threw parties for the film cast, for the, for the film crew and the cast, out of his own pocket, up at his house. Right. So <laughs> that's the sort of amazing man that he was, totally unpredictable. Well, it wasn't an unsympathetic rendering at all in the James Harriet books. No, no. I think that he portrayed uh, Donald as Siegfried extremely well. Um, and I was appalled when Donald disapproved of his character. If I'd been appro- uh, displayed as portrayed as, as Donald was as Siegfried, I would have been very proud of that. He's a pivotal character in the Harriet books, apart from Harriet himself. Well, I would say that next to James Harriet, he's usually people's most favorite character. He is. He is. There's him and his... I mean, the way he and his brother interacted between the two of them, I think Tristan and Siegfried... I mean, to me, they rank with some of the great comedy duos of all time. (laughs) The the love-hate relationship between the two brothers, it was just absolutely fantastic. And so I was... I I think my dad was very kind to Donald in many ways. He he didn't uh, dwell on some of the more difficult aspects of Donald's uh, character, which I actually have, have written in my book anyway. 
that he wouldn't have any partners in the practice to take the pressure off my dad. That was a difficult thing with Donald. Uh, the one or two difficult things, uh, sometimes he could be mean, and other times he could be extremely generous. Right. And, of course, the other thing that my father never mentioned was that my dad did most of the work. <laughs> right. And uh, that wasn't mentioned either in the books. But, again, my father earned more money, so the, the thing was fair. Siegfried married, married money. He didn't need to work too much. Right. My father never received a thing in his life. He needed the money when he was a young vet, and he was prepared to work for it. And with Donald Sinclair, with Siegfried, he had a partner who he knew, despite all his idiosyncrasies and faults, would never stab him in the back. Never. So right. he knew that. And loyalty, of course, is worth more than, than most. Donald was things. very loyal to my dad. The two of them, when you think about it, they never had to write two signatures on a check, for instance, because they knew, each one knew, that the other one was a straight guy. Right. You know, so I think that's important. And you worked with Siegfried as well. Sorry? And you worked with Donald as well. I did indeed, yes. Now, what are some of your memories of him? <laughs> the memories I have with Donald are totally hilarious. Um... Chaos. I think that's the word that I would put. The man could be a genius with some things that he did. Other times, he was utterly and totally chaotic. Right. Um, some of the stories I've got about him, really, uh, I've mentioned one or two in my book anyway. But um, I could certainly, if I sat down and thought about them all, I could probably write half another book about, uh, about the, the, the antics of, of Donald Sinclair, really. He's such a funny guy. He was such a funny guy. Uh, how about uh, Brian or Tristan? How accurately was he rendered in, in the books? Because as you say, I think one of the reasons people are often uh, suspicious of some of the James Harriet stories is they seem too funny to be true, as if they were, you know, they almost happened for someone <laughs> to write them down. <laughs> no, they were, they were very, very accurate. Brian was accurately portrayed as a young man who was a delightful young fellow, but his whole aim in life was to work as little as possible <laughs> and have as good a time as possible. And I think he achieved this throughout most of his life. Uh, and of course, Donald, one of the reasons Donald disapproved of his portrayal was he said to my father, he said, look, you've, you've portrayed me as shouting and bawling and screaming at my young brother all the time. And my dad said, yes, well, you were. And, of course, Donald didn't deny it. You must remember that Donald was a character because he didn't think he was. Right. That was why he was such a character. So when, he's, when, when he was reading about himself in this first book of my dad's, if only they could talk, he, 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 he didn't realize, he, 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 he didn't think he was like that. And, of course, he had good reason to shout at his young brother because every time the young man failed his exams, which he did often uh, when he was at veterinary school, uh, Donald had to pay, and Donald didn't have money in those days. It was costing him money. His young brother cost him a lot of money. Right. <laughs> so there was always there was always that love hate relationship between the two. Very well portrayed in that first book. If only they could talk. Yeah, and if there was uh, one other character that I've always been been curious about because he's so larger than life, it would be uh, it would be Granville Bennett. Oh yes. How accurate was he? Beautiful, wonderfully portrayed. A big, a big man with a big personality, um, an overpowering personality almost. One of my dad's closest friends as well. And he was the, the great small animal vet living only about 20 miles away where the practice used to send all the difficult cases with their dogs and cats. Um, a true bon viveur, um, huge big drinker and uh, and uh, socializer um he wasn't a womanizer at all um but he, he loved the good life and he somehow i don't i saw practice with him when i was a student and he could be carousing until way into the early hours of the morning but he was always dead on time for his surgeries the next morning immaculately dressed in a suit not a not a, a touch pin stripe out of place um he was a larger-than-life character, a tremendous bon viveur. In fact, when I saw practice with him, I only survived for five days. I was a final-year student, 
The pace of drink was so huge. I came home and it was diagnosed, I was diagnosed with alcohol poisoning when I came home <laughs> after five days with Granville Bennett, with Dent, Denton Petty was his real name. Okay. Um, I, went, I got a second wind and went back again. But what a generous man, tremendously generous and a brilliant surgeon. One of the, the reasons that the books are so popular is because, of course, the veterinary experience is a very specific one in a lot of ways. But uh, the stories that, that your father writes take so many different, uh, I know, twists and turns that they often capture the high drama of ordinary living. And in some ways, um, sort of capture a snapshot of the culture of Daryl B. or, or Thirsk, uh, and yes. one that no one else was writing about. What did the people, the farmers, you know, all the many characters displayed in those books, what did they think? Because he was writing these books while de still dealing with them as clients. You know, my father was very worried uh, that these, th these clients would recognize themselves. Um, I told him at the time, I said, I don't know why you're worrying too much, because you've portrayed them all as as pretty decent sort of people. Mm -hmm. There were some miserable people, uh, like the Sidlows and people like this, but these were composites, all made up composites of various different people. Because some of the farmers were miserable, but most of them were excellent men and women, excellent characters. Right. So it was very, it was very, very well portrayed. He was very worried that they'd recognize themselves. In fact, he used to put them off the scent by sometimes he'd, he'd talk about, for instance, a, an, a, a lady called Mrs. Bush, who had pigs, he called her Mr. Worley. He changed the sex round to right. try and put them off. But the only complaint he ever had was from a farmer, an elderly gentleman, with a, as a lame man with a stick, who came in, and I thought he was going to attack my dad. It was in the surgery one afternoon. He was playing hell because he hadn't been included in the books. So, <laughs> so I think my dad got it the wrong way around. <laughs> because th these books are culturally valuable from that perspective, aren't they? Oh, yes, they I've always said, you know, there's lots of vets who have written books. Um, lots of doctors and uh, lawyers, all sorts of people have written books. But the thing about Harriet's books to me, not only are they extremely well written, but he writes about others, not just himself. Right. Um, and they're about people. They're about human nature. They're not just about a vet treating animals. They go far, far deeper than that. And I think this he's, he's caught people's imagination that way. I think this is one of the main reasons why they've been such a massive success. Yeah, and I, I would ag I would agree with that. Of course, I'm in Canada, and and myself and yeah. most of my family members have read them. I grew up seeing them on the shelf for precisely the reasons uh, that you say. Oh, yeah. When they came out in England, what was the impact of of the success of those books on your family? Because you know he was writing these wildly popular books at the same time. He he was still working as a vet in the in the same town in the same surgery with the same partner. Yeah. How did that go? Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, there's not a lot to say about that, Jonathan, because one thing about my dad was the fame never changed him. He didn't change his way of life. Um, he was never a greedy man. When you when you consider all the greed that goes on in the world today, um, uh, young my father as a young man and as a family man, it was in stark stark difference to this. Um, right. He never wanted a huge amount of money. In fact, throughout his main earning years up until 1976, he was he was um, under a regime that was charging 83% tax. Right. And he did. He refused to go abroad and avoid this tax legally. He just decided he was going to pay it, and uh, he did. He, he paid huge sums of money uh, into Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs. <laughs> <laughs> Massive quantities of money. In fact, he got his OBE in 1979, and he was so such a modest guy. He said to me one day, he said, you know, Jim, I've got this OBE. He said, I don't think it's due through my writing at all. It's the, I think the reason I've got it is I've put so much money into Her Majesty's coffers. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, no, 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 that's not the reason at all, Dad. But, you know, that was the sort of man that he was. His fame didn't change him one little bit. He, he still, he, even after paying 83% tax, he, he sold so many books. He still had a fair amount of money left, more than he ever wanted. Right. And that was his attitude. So, and I think it's a very healthy attitude. Some people thought he was crazy. Right. Not to go abroad for a while and, and make a few hundred thousand, you know. But uh, 
No, no, that's, that was his priorities. Were his, were his, were his life, his family, his work. Um, and he didn't want it changed. Why did you follow him into uh, the veterinarian business? Was it because of all the experiences you had with him growing up, many of which are actually in the books? Yes. Oh, yes. Um, I enjoyed going around with him. I went around with him from the age of three. Right. And, my, and so did my sister at a very young age as well. She wanted to be a vet too. I reckoned by the time I was five, I was pretty well fully qualified, you know. <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd seen it all, me. I was an experienced veterinarian at five. Uh, I never wanted to be anything else. I think one of the reasons it's credit to my father, because he was a good vet. He was a compassionate, thorough, caring vet. And uh, I, I observed all this for many, many years. I never thought of anything but being a vet. Nothing. When you read your father's books, how many of those stories do you recognize? Because in your book, you kind of uh, let the readers in on some of the stories and say this was a yes. composite story, uh, this yes. is how this actually went. How many yes. of those stories did you recognize when you were reading them almost immediately? Oh, a lot of them. A huge number. And I knew that my father had made some of the stories up as composites right. of several different incidents that happened on different farms, say, and put them into one. But I recognize all the incidents. I, in fact, I would say 80% of the incidents I recognize. As 80% of the characters, I know who they were, the real-life characters. Right. In fact, he was such a very good, his descriptive powers were so good. He said to me, one of the commonest things I get asked is, why did he set his books in the Yorkshire Dales, which is about 30 miles from here? Whereas all the work happened in Thirsk, in Yorkshire. Why? He, because the reason was he wanted to retain his anonymity. He didn't want anybody to know that he'd written a book. And, of course, that backfired on him because he was a better writer than he thought. When the first book came out, I was sworn to secrecy. I never right. said a word. But the book came out, and a guy came up to me in Thirsk Marketplace. He said, hey, there's a vet written a book, and I've read it. It's very good. And then he said to me, it's your dad, isn't it? I said, oh, <laughs> What makes you say that? He said, well, he's described old Thompson up on the golf course there. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> so so his powers of description were so vivid. And, of course, he described Siegfried, Donald Sinclair, to a T. Yeah. And everybody knew immediately that read this book that my dad was the author. So it was out. The cat was out of the bag. How long did it take people to figure it out? <laughs> I think it was probably days. <laughs> it was pretty fast. Yeah. But they never said much about it. That was the, what my dad liked. Nobody said anything. So how long did it take for people to start showing up in Thirsk once they recognized that Thirsk was, in fact, Darrowby? Oh, well, the Americans, of course, what has always interested me, Jonathan, is that they, uh, in the United States, when it started in, uh, it was published in November 1972, and by February 1973, a mere three months later, he's sitting on top of the New York Times bestsellers. And that was when the, the, the fans started pouring into, into Thirsk, or Darabi, as he called it. It was 1973 when it started. And, you know, it's still going on because there's a, the Harriet Museum in Thirsk, James Harriet Museum. And uh, it's attracting 40, 50, 60,000 people a year in. Wow. And it's, it's just one an award last year for the best, the gold award for the best small visitor attraction in England. So they're still coming in, even what, this is a 20, 21 years after his death, they're still flocking in. And how, so does, it, pretty, how does everyone feel about this massive influx of, of people from around the world? Oh, they don't, they don't mind. I've never heard any bad comments about that at all. None. Of course, he's done a huge amount for the local tourism. Right. Just remember that. A lot of the hotels... Guest houses, cafes, these coach tours, organizing, holiday things. Uh, my dad's done a terrific amount for, for the tourism. A lot of people, he's lined a lot of people's pockets, believe me. Right, right. Which he likes, which he liked that. 
Now this this I this I have to ask you because you you actually worked with with your father. But of all the different James Harriet stories, and everyone has one that sort of sticks out in their head. The one that always stuck out in my head was uh, the eternal war he had with this per one particular farm gate that he said would buffet him high and low every time <laughs> he got near it. I, I don't know why that sticks in my head. It just does. And the others that I talk to, and I have quite a few friends who read who read the James Harry books, they all have this one description or story that sticks in their head as well. What is yours? Well, that's one for a start. <laughs> because it's so different to, uh, to nowadays. We don't have farms with gates now, and all these seven gates. There were farmers called Ainsley's, um, and there's seven gates to open and close, and seven gates to come back. That was 14 gates, 14 times getting out of your car, that sort of thing. I... I um, uh, one of the most vivid things that I remember him writing about. The other thing that always amused me and put me into convulsions was his experience trying to get a semen sample from a bull. And the bull eventually turned around and attacked him. And he, he fought it off with this artificial vagina that he had. <laughs> Beat it over the snout with his artificial vagina. And, of course, this, he got the semen sample in a little test tube at the end, which flew off into the straw, and he managed to get it. <laughs> <laughs> but but of all the books he's written, and my sister agrees with me, and my wife, um, the first one, which is the antics of Siegfried, James Herriot, and Tristan in the old house yes. at the beginning. That's the one I've um, gone back to the most often as well. Oh, yeah. In fact, it came, came out as all creatures great and small, you know, with the uh, the first two books. I like those best of all. That's the first one I found uh, on my dad's shelf, was all creatures great and small. Yeah, terrific, terrific book. I think it's an absolute classic, that one. Uh, so it, it, was the, it, it was the characters that were so rich. And you know, another thing, Jonathan, I've often thought, you know, you got a lot of, um, you lot have got a lot of um, rejections in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. I think these were a good thing. Because when you look at the, the book that was actually published in 1970, so much better than the manuscripts I've got that he did in 1966 and 67. Right. You know, if they'd been accepted straight away, they were nothing like as good. I don't think he would have had the success that he had. Right. I think the rejections were a good thing. Well, and it's interesting... Because he, he, he bettered himself each time, you see. He, each time he rewrote the book, he got better. Yeah. And he wrote the same book how many times? Oh, it must have been about four or five times, I would oh, think. wow. But his big turning point was a woman, a, a reader, he'd been rejected again... But the reader for this big company said to him, I'm sorry your book hasn't been accepted. I would have accepted it. And she said, but tell me this. Why have you written this as a novel? Which he did initially. It was, it was a novel. Oh, wow. She said, what you're writing about is obviously true. So why don't you put it into the first person, make it semi-autobiographical? That'll be far more appealing. That was a big turning point. For him. That was the best advice he ever got. I think it, it just about the best. Just about the best. From your perspective, because obviously these books are, are a family history, a history of your father, but to, to a large degree, too, they're also a history of your profession. So they are. you just mentioned, right, they don't have, the farmers don't have gates anymore. To what yeah. extent do the Harriet books capture a time that's past now? Obviously, you've worked as a vet your whole life. And oh, tremendous. A lot of changes. Tre this, is, this is why they still sell the timeless. They're describing that way of life of the farmer, the doctor, the vet that's almost disappeared. When you think of our practice here, where when I first started in the mid-1960s, we used to have about 90 small farms all milking cows. Now we have two farms milking cows. Right. It's gone from 90 down to two. Um, dogs and cats, in those days, was a sideline. Right. And sometimes, you know, you'd be on a farm, have a look at me dog, will you? How much? Oh, you can have it for free. It's on the house. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> and now, people are paying a fortune to go to a veterinarian to have the dog treated. Right. Um, yeah, it shows he's preserved. I'm so grateful that he's preserved that way of life for us all to look back nostalgically and enjoy, you know. Yeah. What do you miss the most from those days? Um, I think I miss the the sort of friendliness of the the community, the com get, me, get me wrong, the community is still friendly, but in my work, traveling to multiple family farms where the vet was almost a member of the family. 
stopping at farms having tea and cakes and homemade stuff from the farmer's wife. It was almost like, to me, it was almost like a holiday with pay, you know. At times. Right, right. It was terrific. There was a young friend, there's one funny thing happened once, um, Jonathan, I didn't write it in my book, but there was a the local postman, there was a young man called Peter New, and um, he arrived at this farm at the same time as my dad, and he had to post some letters, so it, my dad said, there's two gates to open, Peter, I'll take this letter for you, because I'm going up to, to see a sheep. Mm-hmm. And Peter said, oh, no, Mr. White, I'm sorry, you can't do that. It's against regulations. Oh, come on, anything happened to the letters? Come on, Peter, I've known you since you were, you were knee-high. Come on, I'll take it for you. No, I can't do it, Mr. White. All right, fair enough, fair enough. So the two of them went up to the farm, and Peter, you know, delivered his post. When my dad had finished lambing the sheep, he came out, and the post van was still there. So he went in to wash his hands in the kitchen, and there's the postman getting stuck into bacon, egg, black sausage, and, 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 and tomatoes and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so my father just went up to me and said, Hey, you know, so it's the rules and regulations, eh, Peter? My ass. <laughs> 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 That's what the farmers were like. It yeah. was, they, were a pleasure, they were a pleasure to visit. The other thing I do, I do look back on compared to modern veterinary practice is life was that little bit slower than it is today. Everybody's going at breakneck speed now. Right. And uh, there's more stress. I think the veterinary profession is under far more stress. They're under a far more... They're, uh, they're responsible to a far more demanding public now than they ever were. Um, you know, this business about litigation and suing. You know, my father never had this sort of thing. Yeah. Not so many rules or regulations or not so much paperwork. You know, it's, um, it's um, yeah, his, his job was, I think, a bit more fun than it is today. Right. You had the opportunity to, to create these relationships because you weren't worried about people suing you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it was not too much to worry about. People did sue. They did have litigation in those days, but nothing like it is today. Nowhere near. Well, I guess the final question I'll ask you, because I've taken a half an hour of your time now, is that right. for Canadian listeners... Uh, why should people read James Harriet? Make the case. Why should they read James Harriet to feel good? Right. Um, I think that his his books, out of the pages, exudes feelings of goodness, warmth, humanity, and uh, concern for others. The other thing is they're so funny. If you want to laugh, <laughs> that's the thing to do. I had to speak at the Penn State University graduation in Philadelphia. Oh. And I finished off my talk to the students, and I said to them, hey, I said, you know, you're going into a very demanding profession, a wonderful profession, but there are times when you will feel down and low. And James Herriot at times felt down and low. And I gave them some advice. That was my last word to them. I said, look, when you're feeling low, pick up a James Herriot book, read a couple of chapters, and you'll feel better. Those are my last words to them. Fantastic. And I'm sure they're true. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've gone back to them time and time again. I was at uh, my friend's house a while ago. He's, a, he, as I mentioned, a professor of political science, and he's probably read them a dozen times, but he had them back by his table again. He said, I keep on yeah. getting sick of reading all the political science that I have to and reverting back to James Harriet. <laughs> <laughs> the number of letters he received from people to say that they were in a bad place and reading his books lifted them and helped them. There's lots of people who have written with, with, on those lines. So it's, uh, that gave him a lot of satisfaction, of course. Yeah. Well, James, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. Oh, it's a pleasure.